Welcome to Gambling with an Edge with your hosts, Bob Dancer and Richard Munchkin. Bob Dancer is America's premier video poker writer and teacher. He's written 10 books, including Video Poker for the Intelligent Beginner and the best-selling Million Dollar Video Poker. He helped develop the computer software Video Poker for Winners, and in 2004, he was inducted into the Video Poker Hall of Fame. Richard Munchkin has been a professional advantage player for over 30 years and is in the Blackjack Hall of Fame. His book, Gambling Wizards, Conversations with the World's Greatest Gamblers, is a testament to the many ways you can succeed at gambling. The goal of the show is that you'll be a more knowledgeable gambler tomorrow than you were yesterday. And now, here are Bob and Richard. Good morning. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. I'm Bob Dancer. And I'm Richard Munchkin. Our guest today is gaming publisher Anthony Curtis, who is filling in at the last minute. Our earlier scheduled guest decided to enter another World Series of Poker event rather than come on the show at this time. But some of our best shows in the past have been when Anthony comes on and we discuss a lot of different subjects, rounds table style. Anthony Curtis, welcome to Gambling with an Itch. Thank you. It's good to be an afterthought. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you're near at the top of our afterthought list. I would, uh, would you? <laughs> I'm not even at the top of that list. <laughs> I actually don't know that there is a top, but you're, 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 in, you're it basically. You're, you're in the group. Um, all right. So, uh, gambling with an edge is a show about using clever strategy to succeed at something. A short video that embodies clever strategy may be found by going to YouTube.com and entering. How to Have Sex on a Plane. If that sounds interesting to you, check it out. And if that doesn't sound interesting, maybe I have a mistaken idea about who listens to this radio show. All right. uh, Did you listen? Did you see that? uh, I did. Yeah, it was cute. It was funny. Yeah. So it was an advantage play for sure. Yeah, I, yeah, I saw it. I was. uh, It'll be interesting, fun for the readers to see how quickly they can figure it out before it's revealed, which. uh, I figured it out a little bit before it was revealed. It was probably obvious to others sooner what's going on. The, yeah, I, uh, yeah, yeah. Early on, <laughs> I was getting very uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, uh, we also got an email from a listener uh, who came across a quarter video poker progressive at the win. It was up to around 2000, and the best game on it was 7 5 bonus poker. This is a game that returns about 98%. So with a $2,000 Royal, it's about 100% even. The listener wanted to know if he should be using a different strategy. The short answer is yes. Every different game, however, has different strategies as the progressive gets bigger. Let's assume you don't have the 7-5 bonus poker breakpoints memorized. You should go back to your room and work out the strategy to the game with an 8,000 coin Royal. Uh, you do have your uh, computer and tools with you when you come to Vegas, don't you? Well, now, once you've mastered the revised strategy, go down and play. Don't worry about not getting a seat. Even with a slot club, this is a $1 per hour opportunity, so it's not like the local pros are going to be all over it. Had the progressive been to $4,000 for a quarter machine, and you still find the seat, you should sit down right away and simply play very aggressively for the Royal. Your strategy won't be perfect, but at that size royal, you have such an EV overlay that um, that being anywhere close enough is good enough. Keep in mind, however, if you're not the guy who ends up hitting the royal, even with a, such a huge EV overlay, you're going to have a big losing session. Uh, just out of curiosity, what does that mean, play aggressively for the royal? So okay. does that mean if, if I have... Uh Ace Jack suited, I should hold that rather than just a Jack. I mean, let's talk well, about Jacks are better because I don't know the various. Okay, well, Ace Jack suited would be a normal hold you'd make, but uh, in that game, if you have a Jack Ten of one suit and a Queen of another, the typical play at a four thousand Royal is to hold Queen Jack. At an eight thousand Royal, you would hold Jack Ten. You okay. would normally not hold Ace Ten in with a four thousand Royal. Uh, with an eight thousand royal, you would. Okay, so 
in case I run into one of these things, which I never really look for anyway. But uh, yeah, it's good. I, I would just I would add that I just think that that sort of strategy is super powerful. I mean, there's two kinds of gambling experts. There's there's theoreticians and there's practitioners, and a theoretician no matter what it would be, would run up and make sure he had everything straight. And the one who puts it into practice would go, it would know intuitively, I've got a real good situation here. And we, we used to do that when I was playing um, a lot with, you know, it, it kind of applies to tournament play. You don't have to have, you don't need to obsess over something for to get everything perfectly. You know, we used to say, look, if a, if a play is real close in your mind, do one or the other because it's probably real close to pick them and use your, your mental power counting chips or doing other things. Um, same thing here. If you find a good situation, I was at a bar once. It's called the Front Row Lounge here in Vegas, uh, right off of Flamingo, Flamingo and uh, Jones, I believe it is. And I saw a game and no idea. It was a video poker game, a quarter game with a runaway uh, straight flush, 700 and something on a quarter game. Instead of the normal $62.50. Yeah. And I just... Jesus. Kn- I just knew, oh, I knew it was great. I didn't, I had no clue. It was one of these weird, uh, what they call bonus poker, but it's not really bonus poker. It pays even money on two pair. And, you know, one of those weird ones that starts off at about 96% or whatever it is. If it's even money at two pair, it's less than 96%. Yeah, it's really bad. But, well, it makes up for it with like a 10, it is a 10-8 on the, on the. Yeah, that's 95 or something. something. Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. But anyway, I knew this thing was great and I played, I just whacked away at it until I absolutely had to leave because I had an appointment and I didn't hit it. But I t- checked it the next day, and it was 110 percent. And I knew it, you know. And I mean, you just you've got to you got to play those. But situations. did you go back the next day to see if it was still? Oh there? yeah, it was gone. It was long <laughs> gone. Yeah, yeah. Word got around, and all the the, the fleas came out and hit it. You know, they, you know, it's not bad when you can work for 30 bucks or so an hour. You know, when you're uh, playing quarters while you're having drinks. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it, it, that reminds me of uh, when I first started counting cards. Um, there were uh, several other teams. Everybody kind of knew each other back then because Vegas was a pretty small town. And there was this other team, and we were at a party, and two of the guys on the other team were having an argument because the team captain was watching one of the guys play, and they were playing a $250 unit. That means that for every half percent advantage they had, they were betting two hundred and fifty dollars, mm-hmm. and they were arguing because the guy he had watched the guy make a bet, and they were arguing because the guy had bet three hundred and fifty dollars, and the team leader thought he should have bet three hundred and seventy five dollars yeah. and um and and so to your point about you know know a good opportunity and just get the money out there yeah. you know and and you know a friend of mine and I were listening to this, and we were kind of laughing at each other and the right answer is bet four hundred dollars. I mean, you yeah. know, you have an edge. <laughs> so if you bet an extra twenty five or fifty dollars, it really doesn't matter. Exactly, and the, and the the right answer is to not waste downtime. You know, not waste time with downtime. You want to have, be in action as much as you can in good situations. Uh, Bob and I have talked a lot about you know video poker tournament strategy when you're playing in a tournament. And I, you know, we have a few disagreements because he's such a perfectionist. But I've, but he does agree with me. I think that. Any close decision, you never ponder over it. Just make a play. Yes, I mean, you know, and absolutely. get more hands in. Time get is money. Yeah, yeah. Sure. And I tell card counters. On uh, some kinds of tournaments. They're, they're different kinds of tournaments. Okay. Now, for, typically, though, if it's timed and it's that sort of situation, you, know, you don't want to ponder over a pick em decision because. It, that part is true. Man. But there are tournaments where you have 200 hands to play. And time is not an issue as long as you get them done within 15 minutes. That'd be a big difference. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. But I, I tell card counters when they're learning, if you have a close decision, if it's what to bet, round up. And if it's whether to make a strategy deviation, round toward basic strategy. Good. I Whenever agree. you're in doubt, play basic strategy and bet more. I agree 100%. <laughs> All right. Good um, Anthony publishes the uh, Las Vegas Advisor. In the last issue... You gave an obscure reference that kind of came out of nowhere. It said, at Ellis Island, the dealers keep their own tips. You didn't tell anything about it. So why did you write that? Well, you know. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> well, well they, they invited me not to play there years ago, so I actually didn't know that. <laughs> well, this is... Um in the Las Vegas Advisor, we, we have different sections. You know, we have the news. We have what's something that's current. We have, you know, dining. We have, we have entertainment. We have gambling. 
And usually at the end of all of these, we have sort of a throw-in, pick-up thing. Anything that I think is interesting, I will put it in. Um, th- I thought this was interesting. There's two reasons it's in here. One is I thought this was interesting because almost no casinos keep their own tips anymore. So that by itself makes it a little interesting tidbit. Hey, look, everybody, here's a casino that actually does it. But I didn't. we didn't elaborate on it. And those who have played blackjack, especially in days past, when more places de- went table for table, as they call it, or dealers went for their own, they kept their own tokes, this was a, a, a very um, uh, kind of a subtle uh, way to, to embellish or, and, and to add on to an edge. If, uh, if a dealer was working at a casino and keeping its own, her own tips or his own tips, and they were doing well, and they were knew what was going on. They would tend to help you. They would help you as a blackjack player. Now, I don't mean necessarily they would show you their whole card or flash or do anything illegal, but let's say that you know you're counting a deck down and you're getting down to a shuffle point, and you really want them to deal one more hand, and it's close. You know they're gonna they're gonna go on your side. And you know Richard, I know knew exactly what this was all about, and he's pr- he could probably add to this. Yeah, I, I thought it was interesting because I had no idea there was anywhere left in Las Vegas that did that. Um, th- this is common, by the way, in Southern California. I think all of the Pachanga, Viejas, uh, Siquan, all those places go for their own. The only one in Southern California that uh, that I'm aware of that does not is Barona. Um, I kind of think it's crazy for a casino to allow dealers to keep their own tips for exactly that reason. I mean, not not just like the stuff that's not illegal that you're talking about, but I mean, sometimes just blatant cheating goes on when well, dealers are keeping their own tips. Yeah, I mean, people who are in the business would know the difference, the terms uh, uh, strong iron tipping, you yeah. know, uh, versus soft, you know, soft hustle versus hard hustle. I mean, I've known dice dealers, um, especially like pretty girls, you know, and in, in, in later years, more women dealt and they, they realized that women dealers who could handle the game could uh, could really hustle tips. And I've seen seen situations and heard stories about, especially the the women, literally reaching into chip racks and taking their the money out of the rack and saying, "This is for the boys. This is for us. This is for you. This is for us." And I mean, that's all based on usually table for table. If they've got to split it with a whole bunch of stiffs out there who aren't working as hard, they're not going to make those moves on you. And I, I agree with Munch. I don't see why any casino would allow it to happen. Yeah, I, actually, that reminds me of a, a guy that I used to deal with. I was a dealer 35 years ago, and uh, he was dealing craps, and the shift manager came down, and the, and the guy's like 30 years old, and there's a woman about 60 with her hand on his ass. <laughs> and the shift boss looks down, and she's got $25 on the pass line with odds for herself and $5 on the pass line with $10 <laughs> odds for the dealer. And the shift boss goes around to the other side of the dealer and gets in his ear and starts whispering, you're nothing but a whore. You're just a whore for that money. And the dealer turned to him and said, if she starts betting green for me, I'm going to her room. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean... Uh, it was a known thing. And, I mean, yeah. everything everything that a casino doesn't want to happen and that a player does want to happen happens when it's table for table. <laughs> so, I yeah. mean, that's why this was, you know, uh, it was sort of a subtle reference. And I looked at it and I said, we're not going to explain this one at all. Just put it in there and those who know will know. Yeah. Very good. Recently, a man named Paul Eskimo Clark passed away. Paul had some World Series of Poker success several years ago. In later years, he ran on hard times and was well known for begging everybody for a stake into the next event or for a food comp. So my what I thought we'd talk about a little bit today is being staked at a tournament. So now... I'm not a good player. Nobody would stake me. But let's say I I were a strong player, and uh, Munchkin gave me, put me in. He paid my entire entry fee. What kind of situations would that involve? Would it be 50-50? Would it be what? Would it be? It's different all the time. They're so so different. I mean, first I'll say about Eskimo, um, when I first came to town, I mean, he's an old-timer. I mean, mm-hmm. he'd been around. When I came to town in 79, I mean, I'm an old-timer now, and he was older than me. Well, he's not anything now. But anyway, he was already, you know, well-known, and I would hang around poker a little bit. Not that I played. I didn't play much. It was almost all blackjack and, and other things. 
Um, but I knew poker guys, and I had pieces of poker players. There's your staking or partnering going on then. And Eskimo hit me up a, a couple of times, not even knowing who I was. And he, that's what he did. He was known for. He was also known as being a very, very good player. So it was like staking Eskimo wasn't the worst thing in the world. And he had a lot of success back when it was a small clique of people who played, and certain of them were just much better than others. But I know guys who are staked now, and their deals are so different, you know, from percentages to the, the type of what they call makeup that you have to do where these things actually are carried forward to others that don't have any makeup, which is, you know, kind of ridiculous. You know, they, they end it after one. Uh, it's sort of analogous to casinos who have uh, rebate on loss deals that, that end at a certain point, you know, and that's a bad thing for a casino to do. They get, they get beat on those sorts of things. So people, the deal making and staking gets very, very sophisticated and it really runs the gamut and it's a game within a game, almost like betting on a golf course. Yeah, now, I mean, in the old days, you would hear these 50-50 deals, like Billy Baxter used to put Stewie Younger in, right? And and it'd be 50-50, which is just a horrible deal for the investor. Um, but I think what's happened is... Unless you got a guy who's r- really... Even uh, if it's Stewie Younger, I'm sorry, 50-50 is negative. insane. Yeah, insane. Right. But I think what happened is, over the last 10, 15 years, really smart math people have become poker players and have worked on what is a more equitable thing. And nowadays, guys sell shares of themselves and they try to put a markup on it but the markup might only be 5%, 10%, sometimes 20%, depending on how good the player is. Yeah, a lot of uh, weird stuff used to go on. I mean, the guys used to sell more than 100% of themselves. Yeah. I, I guarantee you that. You know, there are things like that going on. Now, as Munchkin says... Which 50, doesn't work well when you win. <laughs> well, you don't have to win, right? You have control of that. <laughs> you have control of that, right? And you can make sure that, that, that you don't get yourself in that jackpot. Well, the other thing that used to go on a lot is guys would find somebody with deep pockets to stake them, and they would go intentionally dump and carve up the investor. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, that a that lot used that. to go on a lot. Uh, you know, there's a case for if you've got the best player in the world, and he really outclasses everybody... And, you know, the 50-50 deal, as Munchkin says, is just almost always a disaster for the, for the investor. But there is a case that if your guy is really great and you have a complete full makeup, you could be positive that way. You know, if you know that you're going to, when he wins, as long as he's a positive player, you're going to get all your money back first. If you have that kind of a deal structured, and there were things like that going on, too. So, but it got more sophisticated, and, and people don't give up as much as an, on the investor side anymore. But the but the problem with that makeup idea is, uh, first of all, the variance. If it's tournament poker, the variance is so huge. Yep. He could go years before winning the money back. And second of all, if he's in a deep hole, he has less incentive to play. Right. Um, but except that's the worst part because back then. Those guys, the best ones, didn't go years. I mean, they just didn't. These guys were so much better. There was a class, you know. Uh, for instance, the uh, who was it? Ted um, in the uh, in the stud game, I think it was was uh, Teddy uh, Ted, Forrest. Ted Forrest. Ted Forrest. Ted Forrest was on such a level. I mean, you could stake him with confidence. I mean, he was always if it came to a Raz or whatever it was that his his top game, he was always there. And there were certain levels of guys. And remember, the World Series back then would have less than 100 players. You know, yeah. you'd get 70, 80 players, and the top of the the top of the cream of the crop was going to kind of rise. These days, you just you just couldn't do it because the variance is through the roof. You're talking about what was the latest one? 23,000 players or whatever. You know, where they just the set the record on the Colossus. Yeah. But but it begs the question: if if they're really that good, why don't they have any money? You know, well, you know That's why? It. Because they've got they've all got almost every one of those guys. One of the things that makes them such a great poker player is they've got quote gamble in them. You know, meaning that they're not a guy like David Sklansky. The knock on him, you know, Mister Mister Great Poker Odds. He knows everything. You know, cold written the greatest books and everything else. But David wasn't a, f- a formidable tournament player because he was too predictable. These other guys who are the greatest, greatest tournament players in poker have a lot of this, quote, gamble in them. And that gamble then goes out into sports and goes into crap table and goes into everything else. They all have, you know, the other word, leaks. They have leaks like crazy, and that's where their money goes. Yeah. Or drugs or women or, you know, whatever it may be. Yeah, I think that's the real difference between poker players and other forms of advantage players. I'd say no doubt about it. Absolutely no doubt about it. I mean, you could go back... 
I don't want to name names, but you could name a lot of really big names who fall into that category where you just knew they would be broke. I used to talk to Bob Stupak a lot about this. You know, because Stupak, Stupak was a very good poker player and had a, a ton of gamble in him, but he was a businessman first. And he used to, to go on about how these guys, he didn't, you know, he always wanted X, Y, or Z to win because he knew that money was ending up back in his casino in his, in his pockets. That's why he ran, remember he ran America's Cup tournament and all this stuff, because yeah. he knew that brought in the money that was going to end up in the casino. When I first moved to town, uh, I ran into Puggy, uh, and he had just won $200,000 on the golf course from Jay Sarno, I think. And, I mean, $200,000 was an enormous amount of money back in the late 70s. Yeah. And two weeks later, he was broke. Yeah. He was back playing 5, 10, 10, 20, seven-card stud. Yeah, um, that was the other thing, proposition bets. These guys go out and golf with it, you know, and they shouldn't, they shouldn't be doing that. You know, they're up against hustlers who wait for these guys, you know. And, yeah. Uh, but that's what they couldn't live without, the action. They needed that kind of action, you know. It's amazing. It was a different time. And, I mean, there's still guys like that now, obviously. I yeah. mean, they're out there. But back then, those guys just ran the show in Vegas. It was something. But that's the other thing is you go over to the World Series of Poker, and if you wander around the halls, if you, if you know many people at all, very likely somebody's going to come hit on you to try to borrow money. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but, that's just the nature of poker players. Yeah, we've talked about this. That's part of the economy. I mean, uh, poker players will refer to, literally will refer to the poker economy. And the poker economy is, is two things. It, one is the... The ebb and flow of who wins and, you know, the variance and who the money, the winners and the losers and the in and outs of bankrolls. You know, it's just going to go around. They like to keep that money in the economy. They don't like when there's leaks and it goes out. And these guys blow, win a big tournament, take their money, blow it off in a casino. They want it to stay in the side games. They want it to stay in the poker economy. But the other is just the, the protocol of loaning money. And, you know, being being good for it and paying back, you know, paying forward, paying back, doing what you have to do. It's a, it's a really weird kind of lifestyle that uh, I'm too rigid for that. You know, I don't, I don't like that. Yeah, well, and so a lot of the poker, poker players player. have a reputation for not paying that money back. Not I mean, paying it, but they, most of them have, you know, some certain ones. They're like, this guy's a complete stiff, you know, and then that word will get around. But it's that sort of thing. If you do it too often, then no one's ever going to give you money. So it's self-policing in a way. Oh. Also in poker, on the website Poker Stars, there have been some pot limit Omaha playing bots, robots. They have been identified and shut down. Apparently, these bots have had unusual ranges for four betting or calling on the river, and they all had very similar ranges. Any player who had such ranges was determined to be a bot and shut down. If they were playing on Poker Stars, it's a safe, safe bet. They were also playing on Full Tilt, 888, and other sites. Um, strangely, they were forced caught by players on the 2 plus 2 forum using supposedly illegal software, which tracks betting patterns on online websites. Is this a big deal, Richard? No, I, I, you know, I think uh, Lyman was on a few weeks ago, pointed out, that he thinks that there's so much less cheating in live poker because if you're going to cheat, why wouldn't you just go online where, where you know, n there are no consequences and, you know, uh, so uh, d is it surprising? Not at all. I mean, I would expect that there are going to be bots all over online poker and, you know, so, yeah, they happen to catch this particular group, but I'm sure there are others out there. And well, one of those, you know, bots might have been Sklansky. Is there some, no? Okay, never yeah. mind. Just <laughs> you know what? I'm, I'm kidding. I love Sklansky. That's a comment on his personality, <laughs> not uh, his uh, ethics. Well, no, no, I'm talking about the the, the rigidity of the play. You That's know? what I mean. Whatever. Yeah. What, I, what I said earlier. Uh, no, let me let me take that back. I I actually like David a lot. I've had a lot of interaction, and I still think his book Theory of Poker is must reading for everyone who ever starts to play this game so yeah let me get that out of the way but i mean from the time that online started there was there was crap going on from bots to you know spying to you know seeing whole cards to you know on and on and there on. was a bust in england uh last year or the year before a guy who's won a bracelet uh who they busted for he he wasn't using bots but he had six accounts and he would get you know his six three strangers and you know he was just robbing people that way and they were able to catch him through uh, you know, IP addresses and various other means, you know what I mean? So, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I, it's just, 
it's too easy to cheat at online poker. So, well, there was a book uh, came out a, a couple of years ago, and it was a poker book, and it was a little bit, I wouldn't say so much discredited, but nobody paid much attention to it, and um, it was called Dirty Poker. Oh, uh, Richard Marcus. Yeah, Richard yeah, yeah. Marcus, the guy who wrote American Roulette, and Marcus got into a bunch of stuff there that he knew what was going was going on. And a lot of people kind of like they sort of squashed it a little bit. He actually came to me to publish it, and I told him I was interested. And there was a lot of a lot of stuff in there that was, wow, you know, I didn't know if I wanted to, to publish that information. And luckily, he took it out of my hands. He ended up going uh, his his own route and self publishing, so I didn't have to do it. But anybody who wants to read of, of what can can happen and potential, Dirty Poker's got a lot of that stuff in there. Mm. Richard was a guest on this show. Two or three times, yeah. Talking about those two books and one other. That's his. Well, yeah. His his great move was uh, the Savannah. The Savannah. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was on Amer- I was on Good Morning America with him, and uh, as soon as I heard Marcus was going to be on, I was like, "Take me off! I don't want to even be on it because you don't want <laughs> you don't want to do TV with what they say animals, kids, or cheats." And as soon as I was on with Richard Marcus, I says, "I'm in trouble." So there I am. I go all the way to New York. I'm on Good Morning America. And he's demonstrating the Savannah, and I was reduced to being the dealer dealing to him. And when I got when I got done, I got a bunch of texts with one of my buddies going, "Way to be Marcus's bitch." <laughs> <laughs> True story. Oh uh, dear. All right. Uh, you saw an interesting uh, f- woman singer who is very good. She's appearing at Bally's. Tell us about her. Who, me? <laughs> <laughs> wow, you changed gears really fast there. Yeah. Uh, Veronique. Veronique, uh, Las Vegas Advisors, not all gambling, obviously. You know, we do food. We do, uh, we do reviews of shows. And uh, I end up, because of this, I end up seeing just about every show in Vegas. And it's not the worst thing in the world. I'm not really a show guy, but I do sort of enjoy seeing what's out there. And there's a, um, a female uh, personator, singer. Um, named Veronique. Her last name is... Most female piece impersonators are guys. Uh, well, yeah, I was going to say. Oh, that's <laughs> right. I, I, you know what? I wrote that in the review. Female impersonator, impersonation, not impersonator. <laughs> you know? So, no, she's, uh, she's, all, she's all girl, this one, I guarantee you. She's a very good-looking, good dancer, good performer. And she's got just... She can sing. She's got a set of pipes. Uh, she came up... Uh, she was a friend of... A uh, friend or protege of Celine Dion. And they're both Canadian, French-Canadian. And Celine got her, you know, pushed her through and got her a gig playing at Bally's. And I got to say, it's a show that uh, you can get for half price at the ticket booths and all that. I think the, uh, now let's see, what is it? Starts at about 56 bucks. So you can see this show after taxes and stuff, and you get half price tickets for about 30, 35 bucks. And I'm telling you, it's enjoyable as heck. Um, I was just telling Munchkin before, I'll say it. I, I said, you just didn't realize there were so many great women singers until she starts going. You know, Britney, Katy Perry, Lady Gaga, Beyonce, Debbie Harry, Madonna. Uh, she does a country thing. Dolly, Reba, Faith, uh, Cindy Lauper, Pat Benatar, Donna Summer, um, Liza Minnelli, Billie, Billie Holiday, Barbara Streisand. And that's not her best stuff. I mean, when she gets into Anita Baker, Nora Jones, Pink, unbelievable Pink, unbelievable Alicia Keys. Very, very good Whitney Houston. So it sounds like I'm a publicist, but no, I just really dug this show. I just thought it was really good. Kind of show my wife would like. I'll probably take her. I saw Ka recently. I, I I would say if you have not seen a Cirque du Soleil show, that would not be the first one I'd pick. It's a I, little frenetic, right? I mean, and it's hard to follow. It's a, it's supposed to be a story, and you're supposed to follow this story of I guess this this brother and sister who search for separated something. And, yeah, yeah, that's it. I guess they search for one another. And really, it's all about it's it's the martial arts part of it that they push. You know, there's a lot of fighting, and there's this and that. But did they do the? Did they do the? The stage is the star, the star of that show. That stage yeah. that moves and turns. It's on a swivel. It's on all it, this. It literally know. goes perpendicular. Yeah. And, yeah. But, but somebody a couple of years ago got killed and fell off that stage, and everything got got a little bit smashed down. It's not quite what it was to begin with. So. Yeah. I would defend it when it opened, and maybe it's not quite what it was. But uh, I mean, it was okay. I'm just saying, if you had a choice, like if you had to pick one show to go to, I would say probably for me the best one I've seen is La Rev. Um, I like know. Mystere better, but all right. You like Mystere better than La Rev? Yes. Yeah. I liked Veronique. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't know she was Cirque. <laughs> uh, one of our freak. Oh, go ahead. What? One of our frequent guests on the show is Bob Nersessian. 
he says there's he has a book coming out. It's going to be published by you, Anthony. Um, he says he's um, it, he takes considerable amount of the blame for it not being out yet. What is your best guess as to when it's coming out? <laughs> um, all right, I'm not going to make any jokes. Uh, I'm going to say uh, it will be out by Christmas. And I told Bob the last time we talked, you know, I, said, I call him up. I go through his, I go through his, um, through his, you know, receptionist, and he picks up the phone and says, "I know, I know." All right, so that's the, that's where it stands. Um, Bob obviously is busy as hell, and and I understand that, and I get that. Um, you know, he said, he, he, I'm sure he said it on the show. I haven't heard all of his shows that he's been on here, but he's, you know, he sat in front of the Supreme Court. Yeah, oh, yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, I don't think he argued, but he was there. He was on the team in front of the Supreme Court, which is going to make an unbelievably great book cover blurb you know but pretty much all of his stuff is in and bob wants to keep adding to it he wants to say one more chapter you know what this just came up i want to put it in now of course that's going to make the book better so i don't fight it and i go yeah okay fine but we're very very close his uh, his main editor is our senior editor was deke castleman who edited both of your guys books you know deke's a very very good editor uh deke tells me it's in very very in very good shape right now um, I will have to read that book. There are some books that we publish, uh, even some gambling books that I don't read all the way through, like some of the poker books where I don't consider my input that valuable. But I will have to read this one. So once I, we get it and it goes through me, it'll be a pretty quick turnaround. And I'm predicting that it'll be, it'll be ready this year. And, 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 the, and, the, and the community will love it. The, the gambling, especially the Advantage Player community, will love the book. Yeah. yeah. Well, he's a, uh, one of the... Favorite of our audience on the show. I mean, people. Well, it's much better. It's much better. Um, you know, my, one of my mentors is Stanford Wong. I mean, my hat's always off to Wong with everything that he has done. Wong published his first book, which had the great title Beat the Player, but it didn't have anywhere near the breadth of information that this Beat book Beat the Player has. was an Arcesian book. Yeah, but Wong, Wong published it. I don't want to, you know, oh. I don't want to put Wong's book down and say, wow, this book's going to be way better. It is, though. It is. <laughs> it is, because yeah. Beat the Player was very specific. And this covers everything that you guys talk about on this radio show week in and week out and more. And it's, it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, he did a great job at lining up the subjects he wanted to talk about and then, you know, doing the explanation. It's going to be a big book for us within the gambling community, and it's a book that will be a, a college textbook in law schools and everything. It, it, it's going to be good. What other books do you have coming out? The, uh, the ones that would be of interest to, uh, to this audience, um, one is going to be um, Cheating at Blackjack, where we are going to take. Now, these are books. There were two books done probably close to 20 years ago, a little less than 20 years ago, Cheating at Blackjack and Cheating at Blackjack Squared by Dustin Marks. Um, these are two of the best books on blackjack cheating ever done, really. Uh, we've combined those two books. We've updated them where necessary. We've corrected a few minor errors that were in there. Um, and that book will be out also this year at some point. That will be out before Bob's book, New Sessions' book. And the book that will probably beat them all out because we're shooting for the beginning of NFL is a book on daily fantasy sports. And That will be huge. Yeah. This one, might, this one could be really big. It's going to be the biggest book at least to date on daily fantasy sports. Uh, this is a book that could have gone to New York. There's no doubt about it. And it came to Huntington Press because... We're the gambling book publishing company that a lot of people are recognizing like that now. And in fact, when this author went to FanDuel and wanted to talk to the the founder of FanDuel, who is, uh, gee, what's his name? Uh, Eagles. Eagles is his name. Maybe Nick Eagles or something like that. And they said, who's publishing? That was the first question. And they told him Huntington Press from Las Vegas. Now, I thought the that they were going to object to it not being a New York house or something. What they objected to is they said, that's a gambling company. Oh, and that, they don't want they don't want daily fantasy sports. I talked to them uh, at last G2E, which is last October. They had a booth there, and I talked to them, and I said, hey, we have a radio show. I would love to get, like, one of your big players, one of your highest winning players to come on the show. And they were like, oh, that's great. We'd love to do it. Be great. Blah, blah, blah. What's the name of the show? Gambling with an Edge. No way. Yep. I mean, that was it. And if you are a... Um, an affiliate of Fan, FanDuel and DraftKings, which I happen to be, if you go to richardmunchkin.com, you can click <laughs> on the link. Um, uh, they, they, they tell you in the email, you know, do not use the word gambling in any of your, 
you know, promotion right. of FanDuel or DraftKings. Well, I think this is going to blow the this is going to help blow the lid off of it. You know, finally, um, the title, the working title of the book, which I doubt will change, it's pretty good, is uh, Fantasy Sports Real Money. Which right there, you know, that's there's your gambling tie-in right there. Um, this book is going to basically be a three-part. The first part is how the hell does it even exist, right? How does it exist legally? And that story is fascinating. I mean, who is behind it? I mean, this author, he's a former uh, Baltimore Sun and Philadelphia Inquirer uh, sports writer who's been involved with this from the start. And he's interviewed everybody from the, the founders of these companies, DraftKings, FanDuel, to uh, the head of the NFL, uh, the NFL uh, uh, lobbying committee, to the politicians who pushed through the Unlawful Act, uh, Internet Gambling Enforcement Act, of which there was a carve-out for fantasy sports. How did that happen? I mean, somebody got to somebody. Somebody, somebody got knew paid. what was That's going on. Yeah. <laughs> so the first part of the book is that story, as, as in-depth as it's ever been told. And we still don't have 100% conclusions, because every time he gets to someone else, there's new information that makes us go, well, maybe it didn't quite happen. So we're piecing it together. You know, we huh. did a, a book called The Killing of Tupac Shakur years ago, and we had to piece together what we thought happened, you know, there. And we ended up, as more information came out, we were pretty close. Same thing here. We're trying to piece together exactly what went down. Part two of the book is strategy. Now, I, is the guy who wrote the book a player? He is a player, and he gets it, but he's smart enough to go to the players, you know, quote, unquote. The guys, oh, he got players to talk. Oh, yeah. He's, yes. And I've set him up with certain people. Um, you know, I mean, just for example, even though he's not a DFS guy, Fezzik, you know, who won the the, the, uh, the champ, world championship of uh, handicapping, you know, the yeah. super contest, two years in a row. Well, Fezzik knows what's going on in, in DFS, and Fezzik is, you know, going to talk to him. We haven't had that interview yet, but he will. We've got lots of guys, some guys from the inside that nobody knows, some guys who have won giant, like the million-dollar tournaments and all of that. So there's going to be, it won't be the last word on strategy, but it will definitely get people up and going. And then the third part of the book is just going to be a, a quick kind of a, a topper offer of, of where it's going and what's next, you know, a little bit more business. So it's business and, it's business and strategy. I told him if it wasn't a how-to, I didn't want to do it. So there's going to be a lot of how-to, how to get started, what you need to do, what you're up against, what the odds are, you know, who's doing what, and here's what you need to know to be competitive. And when is this coming out? Uh, he's writing it like a, like, a, like a tornado, and we're trying to get it out so it's available you know, around the beginning of NFL. Wow. That's, that's going to be real tough. Yeah. It's going to be tough. We might not make it. We might come out in the middle of the season. We'll see. But it's going to, that one will also be out this year. Yeah. We've, got, we've got a real busy schedule right now. And you're going to let us know when he wants to come on the radio to promote his book. Yeah. Well, he's an interesting guy. He wrote, you know, I don't know if anybody knows, there's a, there's a movie out right now um, about the uh, DuPont killing of a, of a wrestler um, from, um, uh, from California. He was like one of the most famous wrestlers. And, and, and the guy from uh, the DuPont family had this thing called Foxcatcher. And there's a movie out right now called Foxcatcher. Yeah. And he killed the greatest wrestler on earth at the time, David Schultz. And this guy wrote the first book about that, that murder, which almost became the movie Foxcatcher, and then some other things came. So this guy's a real pro. He knows what he's doing. He's digging deep. Huh. Yeah, well, I'm, I'll am i be very interested in that book. I'd love to see, you yeah. know, galleys ahead of time. I'm or, you up. <laughs> Don't worry. Don't worry. Now, I'm gonna want now some what about you? Are, are you touching fantasy sports yourself at all? Because you, you like sports. Well, I'm going to try to touch it as much as I can um, on the affiliate side. I mean, yeah. you know, we're at LasVegasAdvisor.com. We're gonna be we're gonna be big into it, and you know I've uh, I've got meetings set up right now with FanDuel and DraftKings where we're they're interested in the book because if you can't if you can't beat them join them right you know at the yeah. beginning they were very very standoffish now they're going well, what the heck at least it's credible you know wouldn't this be a way for cause it couldn't for all the states that don't have legal sports betting couldn't the casinos figure out a way to get into this business and yeah. have legal sports betting? Well, they're doing it. They're trying it. And you know who really tried it was uh, what they call now, what is it, CG Technologies, I think, it, which was Cantor Gaming. The Cantor books tried a version of fantasy a couple of years ago, and it was specifically the same model that Daily Fantasy is now. They, what people don't understand is that Daily, who haven't done it, Daily Fantasy is a little bit complicated to get into and get started. Once you get it and once you understand it, it's, it's like you know water off a duck's back. It's really easy to do. But... Cantor could never explain it well enough, and their market was so thin, they just couldn't do anything with it. And the same guys were winning all the money, because there is strategy, for sure. Um, so, you know, well, you know, Ed Miller has been very vocal about how he thinks that 
the way it's structured right now is doomed because the the not so sharp players basically have no chance. Yeah, a lot like poker. I mean, the reason that yeah, like online poker. Yeah, yeah the reason poker has fallen off a lot. I guarantee you. I mean, obviously it's what happened, but it would have been natural attrition because people just aren't going to continue to play a game that over and over that they never win. It's never right. going to happen. And I think I agree with that on that point. I'm a big Ed Miller fan, by the way. I met him at one of your parties, you know, <laughs> for the first time. I expected some 60-year-old curmudgeon, and here's this, like, 30-something-year-old uh, <laughs> hotshot, you know, that I just had a great time talking to. But I've always been a fan of his, his writing and his work. I haven't heard that DFS show that he did with you guys. I'm, it's on my list to listen to, but I'm, I'm of the opinion that he's correct on that. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, I'm curious if, you know, FanDuel and DraftKings. I mean, he seems to think that all they're looking at is how do we get to the IPO and cash out. Right. And they're not thinking about the long-term success of. Well, I mean, they may may not need to. I mean, you know, you, you look at, at a Ponzi scheme or a, a yeah, multi-level marketing, and the guys at the top, they don't care what happens later. Yeah, right. Right? So, yeah. you know, maybe they don't need to. But if there's anybody who's shepherding the sport... Uh, or the game, or whatever you want to call it, the endeavor, then, yeah, they've got to look further levels down. Because uh, as it is right now, I think in most cases the takeout's too high. I think the takeout is up around uh, 10 11% yep. in, in most right. cases. And uh, there's too many ways for better players to beat it, both with computer algorithms and, you know, the people who think that they really understand sports are not going to do well at this game. You've got to understand gambling, not sports. That's why it's a gambling game. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree with you. Um well, I think you need both. Well, you need both, but one's be- one, will, one will trump the other. Yeah. One will trump the other. I, I could do better in a, with a little bit of rudimentary inter- information. I could do better in a fantasy sports game or tournament than an absolute knowledgeable sports expert who does, who's never gambled. I guarantee you. I, I put a lot of money on that. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with you there. Well, uh, what do you think about this whole thing that the NFL is you know behind these guys yet they don't want – Tony, Tony Romo to have a fantasy convention here because it's in a casino? Yeah, pretty obvious. You know, I mean, uh, Romo said it himself, you know, in a couple of the interviews he did or he alluded to it. It's, it's really a matter, I think, of the leagues not yet figuring out how to monetize it. And uh, that's when you're going to see it happen. They're already trying. You know, there's been, there's been positive statements from, uh, from the guy from the NBA, and there's been positive statements recently from the guy from, uh, was it Bettman from the NHL? Um, Batman is it? Yeah, good, name, good name for that. But I mean, as soon and, and I'm hearing well, people Silver say, is not a bad name. Silver, yeah, really. These guys all got money attached to them, right? But I, I think that sports betting is eventually going to get through, and what it'll really get through is when the leagues have figured out how to affiliate themselves with the money that's going to be, you know, made through betting. And I think they see it as a, a benign way to get in. A benign way to get into that is to be a part of this fantasy thing. It just dis- it just disgusts me. It's it's that the hypocrisy of them and Sheldon Adelson pretending as if gambling is something bad when it's really about how do I get my cut. Yeah, that's what it is. You know, that's absolutely what it is and they all know it and and, and it's redundant to keep saying it. Their their games would be nowhere near as popular if there wasn't money riding on things like over/unders and point spreads. There's no doubt. Yeah. Uh, all right, we're going to do a few commercials and then we have some more questions to Anthony about change in ownership of a couple of properties here in the Vegas area. South Point has more than 10,000 gains, returning more than 99%. This is more than anybody else has. In June, they're giving away two and a half times your normal free play if you come in enough. If you usually get $50 a week for 200 for the month, this week you can get up to $500 a month by coming in uh, Friday or Saturday on Every week you also came in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday to pick it up. And if you do all that on the last Monday, Tuesday of the month, you get an additional $100. So uh, that works on all of the denominations of it is two and a half times total. At the Palms, the weekly 7 p.m. drawing on Fridays. Winners share $10,000. Don't need to be there to win. Need to claim prizes by midnight. Five times entries Friday 8 to midnight, and they also entry double entries 4 to 6.30 on Friday afternoons. Gift cards are on PFP, play for prizes, Fry's Electronic Stores. Uh, the last week of the month, uh, you can do this for cash. Gifts may be earned at the rate of 0.20%, which is essentially double points. Uh, you keep your points. 
videopoker.com is the best place to play lots of games. If you sign up for the gold membership, eight ninety five a month or seventy nine ninety five a year, you get correction on most game on most games. It's a good place to practice quick quads, for example. Now the game of the week this week is hundred play with quick quads. This game is about as much fun as you have in video poker. Uh, hundred play is a lot more interesting than single line, and quick quads is is fun. So you you start with a hand like nine 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 five, and it's you're gonna go through and it's gonna go quick quick quads quick quads quick quads quick quads. It's actually um, break the machine. <laughs> either, it's either charming or annoying, depending on your point of view. <laughs> Uh, so there's, uh, there is special strategy required for quick quads. Uh, you can get it from the Wizard of Odd site or you can download for free one of uh, my books called A Quick Guide to Quick Quads, which you can find on the videopoker.com website. We're talking to Anthony Curtis. Anthony in, um, the Tropicana has been, uh, bought by the Penn Gaming, who owns the M. The M is bringing in a new top guy. Um, what does all this mean? Is Tropicana going to be good gambling? Uh, it's going to it's going to be interesting because uh, the Tropicana was never a great gambling joint in recently or recent years, but it had some things. You know, it, it had a few things here and there. It's got for locals. You know, the twenty percent rebate is. It Huge. doesn't. It doesn't suck. <laughs> no, you know, <laughs> you know, and there there are things like that. Now they didn't like to put in. They were very much opposed to putting in really good video poker schedules. Um, their blackjack was nothing special. Now you look at the M, and the M isn't that different on video poker, but it, take a look at the M's blackjack games. I mean, the M's blackjack games are as good as just about anything in Vegas right now. Um, they have very, very you know skinny games against basic strategy, less than 0.2% a couple of their games. So I would think you're going to see some of this probably carry over. Um, now they have a new guy at the top. You know, it's going to be the same... Uh, pen gaming mentality in general, but a new guy at the top, so who knows exactly what's going to happen. Overall, I would see it, for gamblers, as probably a net positive, I think, uh, the, the switchover. I, I would think so, too. I mean, the, the big question to me is always, are they going to sweat the money? Which, you know, currently the Tropicana, you know, sweats blood, uh, and they are less so at the M. So right. so hopefully they'll actually start taking some action and I don't know what they're you know, you might lose out on the promotions at the Trop because the Trop, the Trop has these players club promotions, the twenty percent we just said for locals and for outsiders, they they've had a two hundred dollar rebate on loss deal for new sign ups for years. It's it's been the best rebate on loss deal for years, literally, until the recent, you know, thousands that have shown up here and there. But so I don't know if they're and and the M doesn't have that. The M is not a good, you know, join up promotion type thing. Their promotions to me have never been anything much worthwhile. So it'll be interesting to see. They Small don't. like play this much and get a free buffet kind of. Yeah, you know. I've always and I've always personally, you know, LVA likes to deal with Las Vegas Advisor likes to deal with the the casinos that are uh, receptive, responsive. Uh, you know, look, want to bring in customers, and M has never been that. M has always been a closed book to LVA, uh, except for a brief period when they just opened. They've always been a closed book to us. So that's not great news for me, but I just, I still think for the net, for the gamer, for the gambler, it's going to be a net positive. Yeah. Yeah, one of the problems with M is they're in a the corner of the Las Vegas Valley, um, so they're a relatively small number of people who live really close by. And your free play, you have one day to pick it up, ten or twelve days a month. So you have, so this is a long schlep down there for most people. And also they do things on theoretical. So the way to get a good mailer is not to pick it up. <laughs> if you don't pick it up, you can get a good mailer. <laughs> yeah. However, if you do pick up your money, you don't get a good mailer. Yes. Well, that puts you in a bind. <laughs> you know, I mean, I've I've got buddies who have who play who who have a lot of what we call outs. You know, places you can bet on, online, which you know, is some places you're not supposed to do that and whatever. But and they'll say, I don't want to win too much here because I'll lose the account. So well, but isn't that every place in Vegas? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, well, I mean, less so in Vegas. Way more online. Online, you know, they can quantify everything perfectly. If you win too much. They'll just cut you off and you're done. 
But I'm saying, what good is it if you can't? You might as well win and take the money until they cut you off, all right? You know, what's good of keeping it if you can't make money on it? Right, yeah. Now, another casino recently with a new management is the Westgate. Previously LVH, previously Las Vegas Hilton. What do you think's going to happen there, Anthony? That's another interesting one. I mean, that's that's a real interesting one. They're being they're being taken over by uh, management's being taken over by Paragon. Uh, Paragon has uh, they're a really good management group. They really understand gaming. Uh, they were previously at the Riviera before it went down, but they were doing some pretty good stuff at the Riv. Interesting things. The thing about Westgate was before it, when it changed from the Hilton and LVH before it changed to Westgate, they had. For the low limits, they had really good video poker schedules. Uh, a lot of people didn't realize for a place that close to the Strip how good their schedules were. And I'm already hearing buzz that that might not maintain. So, you know, there's a lot of people out there, not of your style, Bob, who love that quarter, the quarter play. That makes their whole trip. They'll play for hours and hours and hours. And any time one of those houses goes down, I think it's negative. So this one's going to be close. I like Paragon, but I don't know what they're going to do with their schedules. Well, but again, they were from the Riviera, another sweatshop. So you know, so I worry a little bit. Yeah, I worry a little. I don't bit. know about video poker, but I expect the. I mean, <laughs> they might not. You know, sometimes they come in and they don't monkey with it. They don't fiddle with it. And you know, the LVH always had a, also a good locals slot club. They had lots of. They called it local hot spot. And they had lots of good deals, you know, for like one dollar buffets and things like that. So hopefully they'll retain some of that good stuff there. What uh, what did the uh, what was the Riviera uh, like? I mean, well, the Riviera. I mean, they did all kinds of crazy things. You know, the th- uh, hundred times odds on craps, uh, uh, dollar roulette, uh, dollar blackjack. They had the only dollar blackjack game, you know, for years, and and they ran it twenty four seven. It was always full, which is crazy. I mean, you have to lose. A, I mean, it's a good marketing thing. It's, it's a good real marketing, good but marketing. But you're losing thing. money on the table. Yeah, but it was a really cool marketing thing. I've always said these casinos ought to do one cool thing like that: bring the people in, make your money on you know on the other things. So they did that. You know, they had the thousand dollar loss rebate. You know, they, they did stuff that might have been a little bit between Paragon or or you know uh, carryover. I'm I'm not sure. Hmm. Oh, we should mention uh, Kirk Kerkorian died last night, so owner of the MGM or majority stockholder, I guess. Yeah, since you mentioned Eskimo, you might as well mention Kerkorian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 98 of, years old. Yeah, one of the you know, founding fathers of, uh, of, the, of the, the New Vegas, you know, really. Yeah, yeah. he actually opened up the uh, Westgate when it was called the International then. Yeah. And then he opened up the MGM Grand, and then he opened up the MGM Grand. <laughs> yeah, when I was a kid, and I just I didn't know where I wanted to make money. I only knew I wanted to make money. I used to read a lot of biographies about entrepreneurs, and I read a lot of stuff. There are you know guys like Jimmy Ling and Howard Hughes, and I read a lot of stuff about Kerkorian even before he got into gambling. Really fascinating background. This guy was a horse trader extraordinaire. You know, mm-hmm. don't forget he he's the one who took. Uh, MGM off of Steve Wynn. So, you know, anybody who wants to read some cool stuff, read some biographies about uh, about Kerkorian. So there are some Vegas legends who, when they die, the town lets, puts them out in style. Big services and stuff like that. Uh, do you think that's going to happen with Kirk Kerkorian? No way. I, I think absolutely not. I think you'll hear actually probably pretty little about it. There'll be none of these great send-offs. He was very, very private. Hardly anybody knew him. He didn't run in those circles. Um, he stayed behind the scenes. He always got managers to do his work. I, I don't think you're going to see that kind of thing here. All right. Well, we just have to wrap up. I just want to say send us your questions at uh, gamblingwithanedge at gmail.com or facebook.com slash gamblingwithanedge. Uh, or you can tweet them at me at RWM21. And you can sign up for the show, get it delivered to you automatically at YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, my site, richardmunchka.com. You can find an archive of all the old shows at bobdancer.com. Very good. All right. So thank you, Anthony Curtis. Uh, thank you, Richard. Go out and hit lots of royal flushes, everybody. Good day. You've been listening to Gambling with an Edge with your hosts, Bob Dancer and Richard Munchkin. Subscribe to the show in iTunes, and episodes will be delivered to you automatically every week. Archived versions of past shows may be found at BobDancer.com and RichardMunchkin.com. We welcome emails at GamblingWithAnEdge at gmail.com. Bob Dancer and Richard Munchkin are both available on Facebook and welcome your questions. 
The sponsors for the show are the South Point Hotel, Casino, and Spa, the M Resort, the Palms Casino Resort, and the website videopoker.com. Join us again next week for another Gambling with an Edge. Money.